Uh, I met Mary Reed probably about three or four years ago. Her resume is like a who's who. She's a national director of pension and protection planning at Pentegra, Pentegra Retirement Services and partner of MNR Business Development Group. She's a leading authority in qualified retirement plans with over 30 years experience. She has an extensive background in plan design and development and experience as a marketing executive, financial professional, pension analyst, and pension compliance manager for an international company. Uh, Mary, take it over. All right, thank you, Richard. Um, thank you very much. We'll jump right in. So to kind of um, give the high level view of what I wanna talk about, um, I do qualified plans. Obviously I, I work with qualified plans and I put plans in for businesses all the time, do it every day. Um, but I realized oh, going back at least 20 years now um, that people had problems on the other end. How do you get the money out? Um, everybody loves that it goes in tax deductible. Everybody loves that it grows tax deferred and everybody hates paying the taxes when it comes out. Um, so what I want to show you today is a strategy um, that I use with clients to help them get the money out of those qualified plans in a, in a better way. So I'm going to share my screen here. So hopefully you can, you can um, see that fine. And so this is um, get the IRS out of your retirement, right? So the IRS is in control in qualified plans that, you know, it's under the internal revenue co code that you get to have those plans, make deductible contributions to those plans, grow that money tax deferred, but they also control what happens when it comes out. Um, you have to pay taxes when it comes out. It's always going to be taxes, ordinary income, uh, whenever you take it out. And, you know, this is, these plans have now been around for a long time. We've had IRAs since the 1970s. We've had 401k plans since 1981. Uh, people have a lot of money in these plans. It's, it's over $33 trillion sitting in these plans in this country. And my experience has been that people get very little advice as to how to get the money out when the time comes. And, uh, and how you get it out will make a tremendous difference in how much of it you get to keep. If I'm talking to someone, you know, and these are questions for yourself, questions for people you know, you know, do you think the tax rates are going to increase over time or go down? You're going to be taxed at whatever the tax rate is at the time you take that money out. So if you think tax rates are bound to go up, you might want to think about getting the money out sooner rather than later. How much of your retirement account do you think will be lost to taxes? I find most people really don't have the answer. To that. Uh, do you want to take your required minimum distributions? Or would you rather not be forced to take your required minimum distributions? Do you want to leave more of your retirement account, account to your family or to the IRS? We all, we all know what happens when you don't plan. You know, those who write the rules wins, and that's the IRS. Um, how have you protected your retirement account from market risk? from health risk. You know, all those things are, are real questions that people need to ask themselves about those accounts they've accumulated. These accounts, I'm talking about IRAs, 401ks, 403b plans, defined benefit plans, any kind of qualified money. And so here's, you know, here's the crux of the problem. You know, if I'm talking to someone and they, they say, how much do you have in your IRA? And they say, I have a million dollars. Great. You know, and they feel good. They've saved a million dollars. They've done a really good job, but they don't really have a million dollars because the IRS has the first tax lien on that money and they get their dollars first. So right now, this person, if I take current federal rates and I'm using North Carolina state tax rate here, it's pretty middle of the road tax state, um, they're gonna lose 422,500 of that million to taxes. So their statement says a million, but they only really have 577,500. That is not what most people are seeing when they look at that statement, but that is the reality. So we have tax risk on this money. We know those tax bills are going to come, um, but we have some other risks as well. We have market risk. You know, the longer we leave that money in that account, the market goes up, the market goes down. Um, we can recover if the, if the money's growing and we're leaving it in there, but when we get to the point of taking the money out, that sequence of returns can become a major factor in the value of that money and what we're really going to get from it. Tax risk. 
The longer we sit there, the more the chances that we may see some change in tax rates. We know we're bouncing back to the prior federal rates on January 1, 2026. That'll bump us up a couple of percentage points. Um, after that, I don't know, you know, who knows, but we also have a huge deficit hanging over our heads. Um, so, it, and we're actually relatively low tax rates. If you look at the historical tax rates, we are at a low point, um, which doesn't really look good for the future. And that's, of course, longevity risk. Everybody wants to live a long time, but they don't want to outlive their money. So whether it's being nice and healthy and living a really long life and running the risk of running out of money or getting sick and having expenses that start to eat away at that account and use it up quicker than we had anticipated. Those are all risks on that money. Um, and, you know, some will hit you, some may not, but they're all risks that are sitting there. And so, you know, what can we do? The people, you know, once you've accumulated money in a qualified account, you only have a couple of choices. You can leave it in that account, let it keep growing tax deferred, uh, take out money when you want, or certainly have to take your required minimum distributions when you get there. That's what most people do. Um, option number two would be to do a Roth conversion. You know, if you think tax rates are going up, I have a lot of those conversations with people. Um, maybe you do want to think about a Roth conversion and pay all your tax now. So you get out from under those tax increases. And then what I want to show you is a third option that most people are unaware of. Um, we're similar to a Roth conversion. We're going to reposition the money from being in a taxable position to tax free, but we're going to do it in a way that reduces the tax and reduces the risk. And we're not doing anything aggressive here. The rules that allow for this have been around for a long, long time. Uh, we're going to use life insurance in this strategy because it gets special tax treatment. We're using it as a tax tool, um, not, you know, not because I wanna buy more life insurance, but because it's the tool that does the trick. And it does it for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm going to work here at the intersection of pension law and life insurance law. Pension law allows us to put the money in deductible and let it grow tax deferred, but we'll tax it on the way out. Life insurance law allows us to have money in a life insurance policy that will grow tax-free, be available to us tax-free, pay a death benefit tax-free, um, pay living benefits if the policy has them tax-free. And so by bringing the two together, I take advantage of the tax deductions going in and I take advantage of the tax-free taking the money out. And then where the two intersect, the IRS has given us a special rule. Whenever you take a dollar out of a qualified account, you pay tax on that dollar at whatever your tax rate is. And there is one exception to that rule and only one exception. If that dollar is sitting inside a life insurance contract and I distribute the life insurance contract, I'm taxed on what the IRS defines as the market value of the contract, not the dollars I put in. So with the right contract, that reduces the value for the assessment of the tax. I can't change the tax rate. It's always going to be ordinary income tax, but it changes the value that that tax is applied to. So let's talk about a couple of these risks, right? So if we have money in a qualified account, if you're not using it before you get there, when you get to required minimum distribution age, you have to take the required amounts. It's now age 73 or 75, depending on when you were born. Um, but a lot of people don't really look at the table and what it's going to do over time. The table's designed to empty your account by the time you die. So what you do, you go to the IRS table. There's a factor that relates to your age. You divide your balance by that factor. That's how much you have to withdraw each year. I've translated that into a percentage. And you see the first withdrawal at age 73 is 3.77%. No big deal. But you see over time this percentage that you have to withdraw climbs and climbs and climbs. So now this puts the older of this account to, in a position of choosing between two risks. Most people wanna lower their investment risk exposure as they get older and go into more conservative, sometimes fixed investments. But if we do that, we're not going to earn a high enough return to replace what we have to take out because Let's say at 85, if I have to withdraw 6.25%, I have to earn 6.67% on what's left to replace it. I'm not going to get that in a really conservative account. So if I stay in my conservative accounts, the trade-off is I'm going to watch my principal go down um, and hope that I don't run out of money. Those are your two choices. 
Um, and so you need to plan ahead for this. And of course, we know if you go into a higher uh, risk investments, the market goes both ways. These red numbers are showing the drops. Historically, the S&P 500 took from the peak to the trough when it took a drop. And if we look at this, this uh, graph of the S&P 500, we see it does climb over time, but along the way it takes these drops. These green bars are showing how long it took to get back to break even when the market dropped. And these could be long periods of time. So as I said, so if you're 30 and it drops, fine, you can wait it out. But what happens if you're 70? If you're 70 and it drops, and now you're gonna have to start taking your required minimum distributions, if not more, when you're 73, you're not gonna be able to wait it out and recover. And so this sequence of returns becomes an increased risk um, as we get older and our time horizons shorten. The other problem we have is legacy here, right? The IRS changed the rules. It used to be if I had money in my IRA and I pass away, it could go to my child and they could stretch it out over their lifetime. They can't do that anymore. They have to empty that account in 10 years. So if I haven't paid all the tax, they're going to pay all the tax. Again, always ordinary income tax. Now, lots of times when these accounts go to children, they're not children anymore. Uh, they're in their 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, sometimes 70s. Uh, frequently, they'll be at their highest earnings in their career, and now they're going to get this dump in of money that's going to push them into the maximum bracket. And so we very we see very high tax bills on this money, um, just eroding it. And that you know million dollars that my client here thought they were going to leave to their child ends up being five hundred thousand. So. Let me show you how we can we can get to some of this. So the strategy that I use reduces the tax bill. I'll show you those numbers. It will increase the legacy to the beneficiaries. We are using life insurance here. That's one of the things that life insurance does really well. We will get that money out of that qualified account and under out from under the required minimum distributions. So you can use that money when you want, how you want, not when the IRS tells you you have to. Life insurance is a transfer of risk. Among the risks that we're transferring here is market risk. The policy I'm using here is an indexed universal life policy. So we get credits inside the policy based upon the more performance of the market. But when the market goes negative, the policy freezes. We never go down with the market. We only go up. And in addition, these policies have these living benefits that if you have a major health event, you can access cash in that policy tax-free to use during your lifetime to meet those kinds of needs. So here's my 55 year old with a million dollar account. And here's what most people have not figured out. If we leave that million dollars in this account and we grow it out over time and just take the required minimum distributions, depending on how long they live, we look at the tax bill. So I've highlighted if they were to die at age 90, the total tax bill on this account becomes 2 million $393,000. That's on a current million dollar account. Well, how can that be? Because the account's growing and we have all those years ahead of us. So we're going to pay tax on all that growth. If we go to this alternative strategy, the tax bill is $379,000. That's it. You're done. So for this person looking to age 90, it's a million dollars savings in taxes. If we compare it to a Roth conversion, I'm going to convert it in five years. So I take my million, I grow it for another five years, convert it. I pay a tax of $553,000. Here, if I put it into this life insurance policy, that market value calculation that the IRS says we need to use brings that tax bill down to $379,000. So compared to that straight Roth conversion, I've saved $173,000 in taxes. So if I put them side by side with this million dollars, and you can see my assumptions here being very conservative, here's that $2,393,000 tax bill if we leave it where it is. Here's our $555,000 tax bill if we do our Roth conversion. And here's our $379,000 tax bill if we do this life insurance alternative. Which tax bill do you wanna pay? It's the same million dollars. It's a question of how you position the money and when you're going to pay the tax. Now, if we go to the benefit side, where do we end up? Well, if we put this into a life insurance policy and we never used it, just let the death benefit go to our beneficiary at age 90, it's going to pay $5.8 million tax-free. 
to my beneficiary. But of course, in a life insurance policy, I can use cash from that policy tax-free. I can pull it out of the policy. So I ran this to say, what if I want to use it for retirement income? I could pull out almost $93,000 a year tax-free all the way till I'm age 100. Um, that means it would also not affect my Social Security or my Medicare. Um, there's still always death benefit. If I die at age 90, add up the income and the death benefit, it pays $2.9 million. If I do the Roth conversion, I could pull the same amount out tax-free from there too. And I actually could do pretty well in the Roth if I don't have any market losses. That's paying even more. That's up to 4.6. But I paid an additional, what, about $150,000 in taxes. So if I got to keep that, because I did the insurance instead of the Roth conversion and I invest that and I, and what would that be worth to me at age 90? That's another million dollars in my pocket because I got to keep that money and invest it. The traditional account does the worst and this is where most people are. And it almost always does the worst because all that growth now is taxable. We don't get to keep all of it. In the other two scenarios, we get to keep all of it, but we don't if we're paying taxes on all that growth along the way. Now, if I just throw a couple of losses in, right, that was with no losses ever. If I throw in a loss every seven years, which is typical what we see in the market, we see this Roth, which was doing nicely, suddenly drop down to two million. That's a matter of how much risk you're comfortable holding on to. That's a risk that the life insurance helps protect against. We get that market drop, the life insurance doesn't drop. But if we were directly in the market, it, we would lose that money. And so here are the living benefits as well. So these would be amounts that are accessible to this person if they had a major health event, similar to long-term care. So an additional savings could here might be that they don't go by long-term care insurance. Um, they use this for dual coverage um, and hope they never need it. If they don't need it, they're not gonna lose it. It'll, it'll be in that policy and ultimately go to their beneficiary. So this has been a really quick overview. The way we do this, we buy this insurance inside a little 401k plan that we set up for a client that wants to do this. Any qualified money can be rolled into there. All of it can be used to buy the insurance. A client can use as much or as little as they want. And we go through this process of shifting it into that policy, ultimately distributing that policy out of that 401k to them, paying that lower tax when that happens. And then they have this personally owned tax-free vehicle for the rest of their lives. So just uh, uh, one more minute and then uh, I'll take any questions. There's a lot of flexibility to this strategy because we can use any amount we want. We can insure the owner of the account or anybody in their family. So if this is about legacy or we have an older owner who maybe is uninsurable, we can look to other family members. And there's lots of reasons why we might want to do that. Um, but in the bigger picture, here's a business owner. This is a client of mine, a husband and wife. They just wanted tax deduction. Uh, they had a $250,000 tax bill. We gave them a defined benefit plan and we got that tax bill down to $50,000. But at the end of five years, they've accumulated $2,068,000 in this plan. So how are we going to get that out? So that's when we go to the life insurance strategy. We take that 2,068,000 and here we're buying the insurance on their children who are in their 20s. The death benefits of those two policies total $23 million. This is a very wealthy family. They don't expect to ever use the money. They don't expect their kids to ever use the money. Um, from a tax perspective, we save them $996,000 with the deductions putting the money in we're paying taxes of $570,000 when we take the policies out. So overall, we saved them $425,000 in taxes. And if they don't pull the money out of these policies, which they can if they find they need to, and the same thing for their kids, we just looked ahead and said, what if each of those kids dies when they're age 80? They just created a $48 million tax-free legacy to their grandchildren. Now, here's another one on a little bit smaller scale. Here's somebody using $750,000. Um, they're 40, 62 years old. If we left that in their IRA, if they die at age 90, there's about a million two left in that account. That could go to their child here. Under the current rules, they could hold it in a beneficiary IRA for 10 years, but then they'll have to take it out, pay the tax. When all is said and done, they would inherit $1,120,000. 
If instead we put that 750,000 into this life insurance policy and the parent dies at age 90, instead of inheriting 1.2 million in an IRA, they'll inherit ownership of this policy, which goes to them tax-free with $2.9 million of cash in it. That's now theirs tax-free. We look out to that same 10 year horizon, they'd have to empty the IRA and after taxes end up with 1,120,000, in the life insurance, they've got 5.7 million. We just leveraged their inheritance from 1.1 million to 5.7. And that will continue to grow tax-free or they can use it tax-free, whatever they want to do with that money. So we're accomplishing several things here. This is first and foremost, a tax strategy. That money is sitting in a highly taxable position. So we're going to reposition it to save them taxes on that money. Hopefully give that client some peace of mind by reducing uh, uncertainties on that money and their risks. Give them the flexibility to use the money how they want, when they want, rather than when the IRS tells them they must. Um, and, a last, and lastly, we're giving them those additional living benefits. So if they ever do have a big health event, and we know a lot of people will, um, that they'll have access to some funds in that emergency um, that they can use to help get themselves through it rather than running through all their other assets. So I know that was like a fire hose of information in a very short amount of time, um, but I wanted to really show you what this could do. Um, and I will be happy to try and answer any questions. Mary, one question that I saw popped up and a question of mine is, as well. Uh, how accessible is the cash values inside of the life insurance policy? Uh, are they, once we start putting money in, do we have mm -hmm. full access to be able to loan against those dollars just like a typical policy? You, you, stay in you, there or? you do starting in year six. It, we take five years to move the money into the policy in that okay. qualified account. Once we're done with that, at, that's at year five, we distribute it. Now it's a personally owned policy like any other. And so from year six on, you have full access to the okay. cash in that policy tax-free, just like any other individual. Okay, policy. but you do have to wait until the full distribution and setup of the policy is completed after five. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. So oh, I, that, was, that was yeah. one of my questions, and I believe somebody else had the same question in the Q&A. So, uh, four years in one day, technically. Four years in one day, okay. That's, uh, okay. Mary, what about um, what about putting some of this money into uh, real estate to grow in either your name or your kid's name, and how would that affect affect how this works? Well, you can certainly invest in real estate. Um, there's no tax advantage to doing that. Um, so this is purely repositioning the money for the tax advantages. If you're going to buy real estate, if you buy real estate inside your qualified plan or your IRA, which you can do, um, ultimately it will have to come out of there and it will be fully taxed as ordinary income, no long-term oh. capital gains. So um, so that's a problem. If you want to buy the real estate outside, obviously you're going to take money out, pay the tax first at your ordinary income tax rates and take the net amount remaining um, to buy the real estate. So Mary, that leads me to another question. Um, we can use a self-directed, you said you could buy real estate in, uh, right, with a qualified plan. Can we yeah. use a self-directed IRA, invest those dollars in that self-directed IRA and then take them out to fund the policy? You you could, but if you take them directly out of the IRA to fund the policy, you're going to pay tax first. But if you can roll them from the IRA to the 401k and then buy the policy, that would work. Okay, because it has to go to be in the 401k. Got it. Thank you. Is there an age limit on this? I'm sorry, what? Is there an age limit? In other words, for an older person? There really isn't. Um, because we. what happens, I do people of all different ages. Um, I do a lot of people in their 70s and sometimes 80s. The oldest I've done is 90 something. Um, but typically when we get to the older ages, we're still doing the same strategy, but we're insuring their children, not them. So insuring their children basically means lower insure, insurance costs or internal costs, right? Which lead, That's to right. High, which lead to higher rates of return. And then based on that, the last the, the last question I had, after five years or after the parents have passed, this now is uh, a, a tax-free income stream potentially for those children as well, right? That they own? Yes. 
Right. So the parents, so the person whose money it is, typically they'll hold ownership of that policy till they die. Right. And the owner has access to the cash and the policy tax free. So they can use it during their lifetime. And, and as you kind of uh, pointed out there, if we insure the child instead of them, that's more income for the parent because yeah. we can build up more cash in that policy. Understood but, because it's lower cost. Right, yeah. right. So once that parent passes away, and we could go to another spouse in the inter interim, but ultimately that policy will go to that insured child. And so now they have this tax-free vehicle to keep for the rest of their lives, building up additional cash-free money, which they can use. Um, Let me ask this other question. Uh, my husband is 70 years old with most of his money in a traditional IRA. He has significant medical issues and might not pass insurance underwriting. What do you recommend the insurance options? So I would, my question would be what other family members are there? Um, we can go to a spouse or we can go to children. Um, so if there are other family members, that would be the next thing to look at. Okay. Gene? I'm unmuted, Gary. Yeah, at the current time, I understand that I can pass $12 million to my daughter tax-free. I understand that in 2024, that's very likely going to drop. Any idea what that might be? Drop to. Okay, so first of all, that's a state tax, not income tax. It can't go to your daughter income tax free. Um, we don't know what the new estate tax limit. Everybody's expecting the drop to drop down to at least close to what they used to be, uh, which was five um, million. Five yeah, million yeah, four, yeah, so. yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. You know, we don't know. We'll see, but that's kind of what's expected. Um, but that's on the estate tax front. It all is subject to income tax. Mary, what about a spousal trust, though? Which allows $11 million for your spouse and $11 million for your other spouse. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, a state, again, a state tax, but not income tax. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, those are two different kinds of taxes, Gary. An estate tax is a tax that you pay on the wealth that you've achieved over your lifetime. And income tax is a tax based on your income. Yeah. And ultimately, if in 2026, when that drops or potentially drops to whatever that level is, with qualified plans that Mary is discussing, those assets could be subject to both income tax. Yeah. And then if over the threshold, then subject to estate taxes. So again, yes. those, those, ta those, that this is a, very important for those clients of the higher net worth individuals, there is potentially a double taxation problem there. It's one, the income tax on the qualified assets because they're always income taxable. And then two, if they're over whatever that estate threshold tax is that we won't know until 2026. Currently it's uh, about 12 million per husband and wife each. But after 2026, we don't know yet. They're anticipating right now about 5 million, but that could change based on who's going to be in DC at that point in time. All right. One and, more question. And, and then we need to go to Joe time-wise. Yeah. Mike okay. Greenberg. Yeah, Gary, ask me yeah. to, to uh, stop sharing the screen. Screen. Yeah. Would you stop? Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. Okay. Question I have is that um, what sort of investment vehicles does this insurance use so that you never lose money? Ah, that's a great question. So the your when you your your policy isn't actually invested in the market. It's the backed by the financials of the insurance company, right? So it's in an index product. You're given a rate of return based upon the market, but you're not actually in the market. So the insurance company with their twenty two billion dollars is invested over an array of investments with different time horizons. Um, you know all different kinds of investments. So in these index policies, depending on the index you've chosen, some do have caps, right? So they'll have the floor, what they call the floor is zero. So when the market goes negative, the policy will never go negative the market. The worst you get is zero return. On the upside, the insurance, so that's where the insurance company protects you. On the upside, some of the indexes have caps, some do not. The ones that have caps, the insurance is, a company is protecting themselves. If your cap is, let's say, 9% and the market goes up 15, they get to keep the extra six. You only get nine. Um, 
but again, some of them don't have caps. So if it went up 15, you would get the whole 15. But the insurance company is able to do it because of the massive investments that they have spread over different uh, different classes and, and time horizons. Okay. Thanks, Mary. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, great job. Um, there's more questions. There are still a few more questions in the chat. We can talk to them. I think Joe might answer some of these questions. Um, Rich, you want to introduce Joe? Yeah, I've known Joe Maniacci for years. We've worked on several uh, uh, cases together. He's uh, had 17 years experience in the financial and insurance consulting. He's been insurance licensed in New Jersey since 99 uh, and is a LEAP system trained. Uh, he provides clients with a proactive approach to business assets and tax planning, offers advanced financial insurance and tax strategies to increase wealth and reduce taxes. So you're going to find this to be a very interesting strategy. And as you can see on the bottom right of his screen, he's a proud partner of the NFL alumni. So he works with some pretty high profile individuals. Take it away, Joe. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rich. I appreciate you <laughs> taking the time this evening. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this high level. Um, so Integrated Wealth Strategies was created about 12 years ago with one specific purpose, tax mitigation, tax elimination. Uh, my partner is a CPA of over 30 years. Uh, I've worked, as uh, Rich said, in the financial industry. We've got to update that profile. It's actually been 25 years I've been in the uh, investment and, and insurance industry. Um, but in addition to working in financial consulting, I also have a little bit of a tax background as well. I was a tax preparer for a number of years, so I've probably prepared somewhere between four and 5,000 tax returns over the years. Uh, we were lucky enough about nine years ago to be introduced to a strategy I'm going to talk about tonight, which I believe is our most effective tax strategy I have seen for the right client in my 25 years in the business. Um, oh, what, why is it not switching? Uh, so, oh, sorry, my PowerPoint is not letting me slip. Oh, there we go. Um, so basically, this is an advanced tax strategy. It's been around for over 30 years. We didn't create the plan, uh, but this is a very effective tool against all forms of tax. So every one of us reports our tax and on one different form or another. Uh, we can report it on W-2 as earned income. Uh, business owners and investments get reported on a 1099 or K-1. Uh, but this is a charitable giving plan that is usable against all types of income tax. Uh, it's also extremely effective at reducing or eliminating capital gains tax or estate taxes. Uh, the plan is not for everybody, but for the right client, again, most effective tax tool that I've seen in my 25 years. So there's four primary benefits of our plan. The first is that for every dollar of assets that gets transferred into our LLC, the client will receive a charitable tax deduction of roughly 80% of the asset value. That means basically for every million dollars that goes into our plan, the client will receive an $800,000 charitable deduction against any form of income, W-2 income, 1099, K-1, doesn't matter. That tax deduction is usable at 50% of their taxable income in any one year, and we have six years to use the deduction. So for example, if a client makes $500,000 a year, the maximum charitable deduction they can take in that year is 250000 But we have six total years to use whatever charitable deduction is created by transferring assets into the plan. So that's, that's benefit number one. The second benefit of our plan is all the assets in the plan will be creditor-proof and lawsuit protected. That means nobody can come after these assets. They're protected creditors, lawsuit, divorce, child support. They are protected completely. The third major benefit of the plan is the assets now inside the plan will be in a 99% tax-free environment going forward. That means any income generated from the assets inside the plan, such as interest, dividends, rental income, all will be 99% tax-free to the client. In addition to that, we can transfer in any passive assets into the LLC in kind, such as real estate, highly appreciated assets such as a stock portfolio or a business. When we transfer those assets into the LLC, we can then sell those assets inside the LLC and eliminate 99% of 
of the capital gains or depreciation recapture on the sale of that asset. So what that means, basically, if we put in a $10 million piece of real estate that has a $2 million cost basis, that means there's $8 million of taxable gains inside of that sale. We can eliminate 99% of that tax, which means the client is only paying 1% of the tax on the sale of any highly appreciated or highly depreciated assets. In addition to capital gains, assets inside the plan will transfer via beneficiary to their heirs 99% outside of the estate and gift tax calculations. So basically what's that mean? what that means is we were just discussing in Mary's presentation was any dollars over that estate tax limit, we can transfer those assets into the plan, transfer control of those assets to the heirs 99% outside of the estate and gift tax calculation. Again, where the clients are paying 1% of the estate taxes. The fourth benefit of our plan is the client will always maintain 100% control. All right, so this is a charitable gifting plan, which means assets will absolutely go to charity when the, when the donors or the heirs decide. But until those assets are gifted to the charity or charities of choice, the clients will maintain 100% control of the assets inside the plan. So what this plan is not, we are simply, we are not using a trust, we are not setting up a foundation, and we are not setting up a qualified public charity. We simply use a single member LLC, which turns into a 1065 partnership, but this is a for-profit partnership. What we're doing is a simply setting up a single member LLC, where the client is the 100% owner and 100% manager of that LLC, transferring assets into the LLC, and then adding a partner. That partner is a qualified charity of the client's choice. Now, it has to be a charity that they don't sit on the board or control in any manner. But now what this does is when we add the charity as a partner, all right, the charity will be a partner, but they have no say or control in how your business is operated. Essentially, they are just a silent partner in the LLC. Now, because they're a silent partner, they have no say in control of what you invest in inside the LLC or at how you um, how you access the funds inside there. Now, we have to do everything properly, so we can't just basically put money in and pull money out. But ultimately, as that silent partner, being a charity or nonprofit, any of the income tax liability that flows through the charity is non-taxable to them. So that's what gives us the tax-favored environment. It's not that we're creating a nonprofit. It's that our partner just doesn't pay any tax on the income or passive assets that it receives. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an advanced tax planning strategy. This is not for everybody. The clients that we are typically looking for have a high income of over 500,000 or more. Now that income can be W-2 income, business income, interest income, or even income from the uh, sale of a highly appreciated or highly depreciated asset, or could be a client who has just large estate tax liabilities. So anybody over the 32% tax bracket, like I mentioned before, anyone who has a high, highly appreciated assets, such as a stock portfolio, piece of real estate, or even a business they're getting ready to sell, uh, or anyone over the estate tax thresholds. So anyone who's looking at large family estate taxes going forward. Uh, also owners of C corporations. Owners of C corporations are subject to double taxation. What that means is the corporation pays tax. And then when the income is distributed to the client, they pay personal income tax on that as well. So we can eliminate the double taxation on any C corporations. The last benefit, really, or who we're looking for is people who are looking to create a family legacy, or again, are looking for those large estate tax problems. So people who are charitable-minded are absolutely preferred. Uh, as I say, most of our clients are charitable-minded. All of our clients are really tax-adverse. So this is an advanced tax planning strategy, but ultimately, at the end of the day, this money will be going to charity. Now, how we combat the money going to charity 
very much like in uh, Mary Reed's plan, we will use some of the tax savings created by the plan to create a life insurance policy. And that life insurance policy is built to protect the assets inside the plan and ultimately replace the gift of charities down the road. So we're not disinheriting the heirs or disinheriting the charities. The only people that are losing in this plan are the IRS. Well, because we're eliminating, we're creating large tax deductions again, charitable tax deductions against any form of income. We're eliminating the flow through tax of 99% of taxes on any assets inside the plan. And we're transferring them 99% outside of the estate taxes, ultimately to the heirs. <clears throat> In our 10 years of doing the plan, we have over 150 cases in place. We are approved by the Board of CPAs to teach this and give CPE credits. Uh, we have gone to 12 plus major life insurance carriers and all their advanced markets teams have approved this plan to go ahead and write the insurance component that's going to be needed. Uh, again, much like Mary's plan, the insurance component, if we have people who are older or unhealthy, the insurance component can be written on any family member, husband, wife, children, grandchildren. Uh, even two years ago, we wrote the insurance on a family niece. So we have the ability to write additional uh, family members. Uh, this plan, again, has been around for over 30 years. We have no question of the legality of the plan. It's a matter of doing it properly. Uh, this is being taught by American College and being used more and more often as a popular plan in the and the estate planning and financial planning world. I'm gonna stop questions because I just threw a lot at you and I know we're at about 8.50 uh, and this is probably gonna need a lot more explanation for a lot of people, but I'm happy to get into that, spend some time, uh, have a follow-up call to talk about the plan designs, how we, uh, how we can get all the effectiveness that I've discussed this evening, but uh, I'll open the floor up to everybody for questions because I know I'm sure there's got to be some. I'm going to read a few questions to you from the from the question chat, please. Uh, and then there's a couple for Mary as well. Uh, how and can we stop the screen sharing that we can see you? Yeah. All right. Yep. I'm going to stop that. So everybody, that's my infor information's there. If anybody needs to get a hold of us, please go ahead. That was that was terrific. Uh, I love it. We're doing some of this, but. Um, First question is, how does this compare with a donor advised fund and how much does it cost to set this program cost set okay. up? So, yeah, so a donor advised fund is really just a collection of investment vehicles that you set up through like Charles Schwab or Fidelity. But once you put the assets in there, those assets, you lose control. So the reason we're not using a trust, a foundation or a nonprofit or a donor advised fund is because all those plans are highly effective. But as soon as you transfer assets into those plans, you lose some form of control, which means you lose accessibility or, excuse me, potentially what you can invest in. By using our 1065 partnership, this allows the client to maintain full control of the assets inside the plan and access those assets up if accessed properly through loan provisions. So again, this plan is different it gives you better, better access control and flexibility of the plan. Because again, the, the biggest reason when problems with charitable gifting in your traditional platforms is simply one of lack of control. Most people do not want to lose control of their asset potentially for generations. That's what the biggest benefit, in my opinion, of this plan, as I mentioned, the number four item is the client will always maintain 100% management control. Is there a time period during setup when costs are greater than appreciation? No. So our, our plans are always 100% cash flow positive, meaning we generate enough tax savings to cover the cost of the plan. Last year, our typical plans ran between thirty dollars and $60,000 in total to set up. So yes, they can be expensive, but these plans are, again, not designed for everyone. We have to have substantial assets. Our typical clients make over 500,000 a year of, of adjusted gross income or have over two and a half to $3 million of net assets. They don't have to have both, but they typically have to have one or the other, high income or high assets or any form of high tax liability. So let me uh, just interject something, uh, Gary and Joe. Joe and sure, I are in the case right now. 
and the individual is, is selling uh, several businesses and several pieces of commercial property, it's going to be about 15 to $20 million, which will create probably about a 40 or 45% tax. So I figure it's eight or $9 million. This will get it down to about 80 or $90,000. One percent. One percent. That's tax liability. Absolutely. Thank you, Rich. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. How quickly can this conversion process be done? Uh, last year, we did a $40 million note on December 30th. Uh, so we can do this in pretty short order. It typically takes us about five days, business days, to get everything set up. Our, our team and tax attorneys would request that we give everybody at least two weeks. Uh, but we can turn these around in pretty short order. Typically, it's more time to get clients comfortable with the strategy, understand what we're doing. And then obviously the insurance component, that's a 60 to 90 day process, but that can be done in conjunction with setting everything up. Um, Mary, what is the downside to the insurance strategy? Um, the downside to the insurance strategy would be number one, we're tying up that money for at least five years. Um, so it's not accessible instantly. It's a long-term plan. It's not short-term, you know, we're long-term. And uh, if someone needs cash flow in this first five years, we want to leave that for them. Don't put that in the insurance so they have it available. Um, the other um, downside, I'm not sure. I don't really think it's a downside. Sometimes we run into people who um, they just like being in the market. You know, they think they can make more money in the market. Um, and sometimes don't really look at the whole picture. Um, and fine, if you know if, if that's where you're comfortable and you think you really can do better, go for it. Um, you know, so because we're going to restrict, you know, you're going to be in this life insurance policy. Yeah. Is there um, a time period during setup when costs are greater than appreciation? Um, if that if that question's for me, um, we're actually taking advantage. We particularly use a policy here. We want low cash values in the initial years to get that tax discount. Now, as I just said, this is a long-term policy. If you told me you were gonna start this, but you were gonna surrender this policy in three years, I'd say, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it because you're gonna lose money. But uh, this is a policy you're going to buy and hold. We're going to take advantage of those expenses that are in the first five years and let the IRS eat the expense of those instead of you by reducing your tax bill um, and then, you know, going forward, that policy value is going to, you're going to see it really start to take off and increase. Isn't there significant cost in the first year, uh, if you're 70 or 75, to buy a life insurance policy to do this? Absolutely. The mortality expense is very high the older you get, which is why typically when we're talking to people in their 70s and older, we're usually insuring a younger family member. Yeah. Any complications? We would do the if same you're... with the younger to keep that cost down. Sorry, we would yeah. do the same. same you thing, wanna, right? Whenever you're using insurance as a, basically a, a leveraging vehicle, you want to keep that cost as low as possible, and that typically means going with the youngest and healthiest that you can in the family. Yeah. Uh, Mary, I, I assume you would agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. And, so and if you have so... multiple, I'm sorry, there was one other question. Uh, if you have multiple children, the policies can absolutely be on multiple children. It doesn't have to be on one. My strategy, the, the parents would own the the policies, but the kids would be the insured. Mary, I think yours would probably be roughly the same, right? It's the same. same. And we yeah. can divide it up any, any way the client wants. Um, and right. And the client owns the policies. We just have multiple insureds. Yeah, I you, suspect you, know, you can do the same to... thing. Can you do the same thing for grandchildren to uh, yeah. maybe fund a, a, a college education or something like that? Yeah, we've done we've done some grandchildren. Yeah. 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 Any complications if your IRA has both taxable and some non-taxable money? Well, you have complications right off the bat because you have two kinds of money in the same <laughs> IRA. Um, you got tax challenges, but we would only use the pre-tax money. We would want to split it off and you kind of reconcile that IRA because this is really for pre-tax money um, that we're trying to get the tax leveraging. Yeah. And, and Richard, we don't use we don't use Roth money for the same reason. I mean, you could go buy an insurance policy with the Roth money, absolutely, but you won't get the tax play as part of that. And, and there was a question on the chat about husband and wife. Yeah, so it's it's I think for both plans, Mary. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's anyone in the family with insurable interest 
yes. or, or, or necessarily a beneficiary. So anyone that you would assume would be a beneficiary of your assets, uh, because some people don't have children, right? Uh, I would assume it would be any potential uh, family or beneficiary of the of an estate. Right. In the qualified world, it's anybody in whom you have an insurable interest, yeah. um, including business partners. I've, although I haven't had anybody do one on a business partner, but they could. Um, so, yeah, family members. There's always going to be an insurable interest there. Yeah. Um, you may have answered this, but I don't remember. How liquid is the life insurance strategy? The life insurance that I'm doing, as I said, once you get to year six, um, you have full access to the cash in that policy. Obviously, the longer you wait, the higher the cash value will be and the more cash will be available, but it's accessible um, as soon as we get to year six. If we want to, I can tighten it up to three and a half years if we really want to compress it. I can't get shorter than that. Um, so if your kid owns the policy and you're the, I guess, administrator, can you draw the cash out or does the child have to go draw the cash out? Yes, they, they would be the owner. They would be the owner. The kids would be the insured. The owner has the ability to do withdrawals and right. they, they control, they're, they pull the strings on the policy. The insured is just a, forgive the language, just a body uh, at that point in time, an insurable body. The owner is the one who handles that. Sorry, Mary, I didn't. Uh, no, no, it's the same. And, and I would just add, um, the owner is also the beneficiary. Yep. So, oh. you know, if if they took a million dollars and bought insurance on their child and it buys $5 million of insurance and heaven forbid something happened to that child, the parent's going to get the $5 million death benefit. Tax can, I, can I add one other benefit? And Mary, I believe you use some of the, we use some of the same products. A lot of the products these days or insurance products we use have living benefits as yes. well. So yes. those living benefits, benefits, kick in up to a million dollars in many cases for any any large family medical event, uh, critical illness, chronic illness, um, Alzheimer's, uh, accident. So um, these policies on children and other family members could also be really true protection vehicles for that family and that family member. Uh, even some of them even cover um, fertilization, I, I believe. So some of these things are highly effective uh, protective plans for everyone in the family. Uh, that's why we typically like to insure everyone so yeah. they all have those those benefits as well. Yeah, that's always a factor for me too with clients. Who are those benefits important to? Um, yeah. you know, who needs them? So if I am talking to that older person who has the account, even though they're more expensive to insure, sometimes we are writing it on them and maybe them and their spouse because they want those living benefits. Would you recommend doing this strategy over, say, a 529 plan for your grandchild? If you're working with qualified money, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I would recommend hers. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So you can get a lot more for less, basically. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Without the risk of a 529. Quite yeah. frankly, 529s are most, one, typically very expensive internal fees wise. And also potentially you're subject to market risk. You know, uh, what happens if your child was going to school in 2021 and you just lost 30% of your portfolio? So um, the insurance policy would grow as would the amount your child gets and your grandchild gets and it's tax free and it can be taken out after six years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Seems like a seems like a no brainer strategy. Yeah. So, any other questions? Uh, yeah, there is some in the chat that I'm trying to. Oh, there we go. Uh is there a period of setup time? No, no, no. That's uh, 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 how do we work with personal financial advisors? All right. How do we work with other advisors? Um the one above we, that, Joe. We look at other advisors as teammates. So Mary, I would I've I've spoken with Mary a number of times. Uh we're kind of brought in as the hired gun, so to speak. So we bring a solution that a lot of your advisors maybe are very good advisors, just not expertise is in. Uh so we basically work, I, you know, I know our firm will work with CPAs, attorneys, uh, other advisors on a regular basis. Probably about 80% of the business we do is referred from other financial professionals. Yeah, I said at the beginning that a lot of financial advisors are, are pretty good, but they're probably not familiar with yeah. either of these two yeah. strategies. Yet. Yeah, in our, in our case, just, you know, because this is, you know, charitable giving plan, most advisors just don't use that section of the tax code on a regular basis. 
Uh, and I think Mary's plan was same. You have you have advisors who are just not, um, that's not what they do all day, every day. You know, so you want to bring somebody in who knows what they're doing in that particular space. So, uh, Richard, any other questions question? before we leave? We're about nine o'clock, which is good. Um, Gary, oh, let, let me ask an important question. Does FJMC qualify as a nonprofit partner? Are you do have a 501c? Yes. Absolutely. Now, again, the 501Cs that we utilize, the client cannot have any participation in that 501C at all. If they are a board member, they run any facilities, no. But what we will do is we employ a, a type of a donor advised fund as an intermediary. That donor advised fund creates a separation and that separation is the donor advised fund, and then money can flow through to your organization. But uh, I'd be very cautious. Uh, it brings into the question of self dealing, which we want to eliminate at any cost. Uh, you know, so uh, we typically will not use a charity or five hundred one c again that the client has any uh, any part of. You know, if they're if they're just you know a part of a church or a synagogue, something like that, that's fine. But they can't sit on the board. At what net worth would you say your strategies become most effective? Uh, I think Mary's is more qualified dollar assets, not to answer for Mary, but. Right, mine is, am I, am I muted? Can you hear nope, me? No, we can hear you. Okay, okay. It's, it's showing muted on my screen. Yeah. Um, for for the clients I'm working with, we're, again, it's not their total assets. I'm just looking at their qualified money. Uh, which may be a big or a small portion of their entire okay. estate. Um, but typically we're working with accounts of $500,000 or greater, typically. Yeah. And for us, uh, typically two and a half million dollars of net worth, uh, you know, and that, that's combined net worth or anybody who, I mean, we have what's called a young affluent. You have someone who is in their forties, they may be not worth two and a half million dollars, but they're making 500, 600, 700,000 a year. Uh, and they're building to be that affluent, but they're not just there yet. They could be a potential client. But typically, again, about two and a half million dollars of, of assets or about 500,000 of taxable income on an annual basis are potential clients. I want to thank you guys. This is extremely informative. And uh, obviously, uh, you've left us with, uh, at least me, with a lot to think about. Um, I thought I was in really good shape. I think I am. But uh, I obviously think I can be in a lot better shape. So, We're here. Uh, Rich, thank you so much. Did you want to say a couple words, Rich? Uh, well, thanks, uh, Gary. Thanks, uh, Bruce. Uh, thanks for making this happen. I've been pushing for this for, for quite some time. I'd like to do these, you know, these type of things and bring in my experts periodically. We may want to do a re refresher sometime in the future on this. Uh, you know, if anybody wants to get a hold of us, I, I guess they can either do that through me or through Gary or Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do have the information. Yeah. And I put my email uh, correction in the chat box, but obviously the best way to communicate with us is through the host of the meeting uh, and any communication, feel free to include everybody if, uh, direct questions with me. Absolutely. Appreciate everybody getting on. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a great evening, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. It was great. Our pleasure. Okay.